Victor. A big welcome to the familiar faces and a big welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. First, two announcements. In case of an emergency, please exit through the two doors at the back and the two doors in the front. And if you would like to ask questions to our speakers and panelists, please use this menti.com on your mobile phones. You can download it. This is the password, 81970931, or you can use the QR code. Now, in Global Outlook, we try to give you the big picture of the times we live in. So if we were to take a historical, philosophical, civilizational perspective, we realize that transformations are driven by revolutionary changes in three areas of human life. First, how we get energy, so starting with the discovery of fire. Two, how we produce food, the agricultural revolution, for instance, that made human beings into settlers and all the transformations that followed. And three, how we communicate, how we transfer ideas, language, word of mouth, the invention of the printing press, radio, television, internet, and now what we all love to hate, social media. In addition to the revolutionary changes going on in these three areas right now, as we speak, we are also faced with war and pandemic. So what can we do? Will the 2020s transform for the better or for the worse? You know, doomsayers, the, you know, the people who always say that terrible things are going to happen, they're usually wrong, but they're important. If they were not there to tell us that we are going to hell, we will be in hell. Thanks to their warnings, we can take preventive action. We can create opportunities out of crisis. We can emerge stronger, better. Really? Can we? Let's find out from our wonderful speakers, uh, knowledgeable, uh, enlightened, educated, of course, but uh, inspired in their own way, in their trajectories of their life, much to contribute to all of us because of their experience. And we begin with Norway's Foreign Minister, Anniken Huitfeldt. Uh, she occupies a hot seat in a difficult situation right now. And she's going to talk to us on Norway in a transformative world. Thank you, and thanks for being invited to Arndal, a town with its local history strongly linked to both our national and also global history. The Norwegian Labour Party was founded here after a massive economic crash in the 1880s. The banks in town went bankrupt within months. The total tonnage of Arndal's Prout shipping fleet shrunk by 50% during the following 15 years. People moved away and within a couple of decades, Arndal's position as the most important shipping hub in the Nordic region had vanished. It was indeed a transformative decade for Arndal. One explanation given for the Arndal crash was the transformation from sailing ships to steamers. Some ship owners hung on to the sailing ships, unable to raise capital for investing in future technology. Others invested too early in immature steamship technology. Nowadays, we are amid a much larger transformation. And this time, it does not only affect Arndal, but the whole world. Norwegian shipping was indeed a key reason for why an independent Norwegian diplomatic corps was established in 1905. Norwegian shipping has contributed strongly 
to international free trade simply by transporting goods between countries. A major task for the diplomatic corps today is to promote a green transition, to bring Norwegian knowledge and expertise about sustainable energy sources to the world markets. Our expectations must be ambitious, but also within reach. In the current energy crisis, we have been reminded on how, it, it, how important it is to be resilient. Metals for battery production and renewable energy is one important contribution. Norway is Europe's largest producer of aluminium, silicon and manganese, a key, all key components in battery production. And of particular relevance for this region, increasingly called the Battery Coast. There is a massive demand for knowledge and expertise about offshore wind power, solar cell and carbon capture and storage. We have that. When I go abroad to places like India or Egypt, that is the kind of expertise they ask for. This is the kind of deals they want to sign with Norwegian companies because they will cut their emissions and produce renewables locally. Renewables that will reduce countries' dependency on long-distance deliveries from countries like Russia. I have been very clear in my marching order to the Norwegian Foreign Service. This is the area we shall push forward. Renewables is the area where Norway can contribute the most to the green transition. And I stress the word transition, because unlike Arndal in the 1880s, we must get the timing right, which means that until alternatives, renewable energy resources stand ready, we need to continue to export the gas that Europe so badly needs. 22% of the EU and UK's total gas consumption is gas from Norway. We are close to an energy crisis in Europe. In this situation, some voices argue that we should reduce our export of gas and oil. Well, I beg to differ. To reduce our gas export now, before renewable sources stand ready to take over, would be irresponsible. Colleagues from other countries keep asking me if we can increase our gas production. But we already produce as much as possible. We need both the capital and the technology to manage the transition. We can see that day coming, and it will come, uh, when we no longer will export fossil fuel. We will welcome that day, but the timing is not right, not yet. And we cannot act alone. China is alone responsible for 30% of the world's total CO2 emissions, if we include the US, the EU, and India, the four of them are responsible for almost 60% of our total CO2 emissions. It goes without saying that we need to have them all on board if you are to solve our greatest challenge. We need more international cooperation, not less. Isolation is not a sustainable road to follow. It does not work. Even when tensions are high, whether it is in Europe, Asia, or elsewhere. These days, our cooperation with Russia has effectively been put on hold. Due to the un 
unprovoked attack on Ukraine's territorial integrity. But to boycott diplomatic contact and dialogue, whether our aim is to promote renewable energy or human rights, is not an efficient instrument. The current situation with Russia is exceptional, which makes it even more important to have an open dialogue and promote cooperation with others. We cannot promote an international world order by decreasing political contact. We need the common rules, the common institutions, and a common understanding of what we are trying to achieve. It provides a common road to follow. Russia departed from that road. The war in Ukraine may be regional, but it has global consequences. It has accelerated rising prices and shortages of food. It has strained the relations between Russia and the West and challenged the European security landscape. In the aftermath of Russia's brutal invasion in, of Ukraine, the EU has risen to the occasion. Norway's close cooperation with the EU means that we stand solid together with Europe against the Russian aggression. The invasion will affect Norwegian security policy for many years to come. Our allies in NATO are more united than ever in our determination to defend our democracy. With Finland and Sweden as new members of NATO, new possibilities open for improved defense cooperation, making the Nordic region even safer. We do not want to go back to a divided world dominated by the interests of superpowers. But we should not be naive. Major powers must also benefit from a rules-based world order. Disarmament, for, for example, will protect themselves. Cut in CO2 emissions, respecting human rights, or promoting free trade will and must be in their self-interests. We can provide the arguments. We can try to pursue countries like China and the US and through dialogue and perhaps convince them. But our proposals must reflect reality. We must relate to the world as it is. In 1951, my predecessor, Halva Lange, held a speech to students in Bergen, where he warned us not to forget that the social and cultural welfare for our people is part of our preparedness for the danger posed by dictatorial states. The welfare for Minister Lange referred to are the, the democratic, liberal values we have to build our societies upon. Nowadays, these values are under pressure. One third of the foreign ministers in the NATO alliance today are women. This summer, we met in Madrid. One issue several of my colleagues raised was the US Supreme Court's overturn of the Roe versus Wade ruling because it represents a step backwards. This is not only about individual rights. Uh, when women are denied the right to decide over their own body, or when gay people are being persecuted or harassed, yes, we care for them. But this is about them something more about the greater cause. Because when authorities want to control the sexuality of women or regulate love between adult human beings, it is an abuse 
and an attack against us all. In the rough landscape we have in front of us, because this will be rough, our liberal values will be threatened. In times of crisis and harsh economic realities, the force of polarization tends to move forward, leading the way for wing parties and alternatives to democracy for simple solutions. Women, gay people and minorities are first in line to be harassed and discriminated against when a country moves in an authoritarian direction. Often, together with foreign countries and Im immigrants, pointed out as scapegoats and giving the, given the blame for troubled times. So we must stay focused. In the mid-1800s, and way beyond the economic crash in Arndal, Norway was a very poor country. Many left, looking for better opportunities ab abroad, such as Nils Larsen from Tromøya. He lived here in Arndal. Wednesday, I'll meet Mr. Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia, I don't know if he has ever heard about Nils Larsen, but Nils ended up in Australia in 1855. There, he married and changed his name from Larsen to Lawson, and had a son he named Henry Lawson. And Henry Lawson became a famous poet and story writer in Australia. Now, if Mr. Larsen or Lawson had lived in Norway today, Perhaps he never would have emigrated. Back then, Norway was a harsh place. Now it's different. Now we have the possibility to reach out and try to do good wherever we can. But we do not aim to make the world a better place because we are kinder than others, nor because we have a higher moral than others. We do it because it is an investment in our own security, in our own future. It is in our interest. Peace and predictable world order is a core interest for Norway. In fact, it is the core interest. When we engage as mediators or peace brokers in faraway conflicts, or when we stand solid with our allies in NATO, or promote closer European cooperation, or defend international law and the multilateral system. It is, in the end, all about that one goal, peace and predictability, the preconditions for everything else that we want to achieve. Thank you. And it was really nice the way you went from steamboats yeah. to, you know, abortion to Lawson, Lawson, Lawson. <laughs> it was really a sweep. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. So that was interesting. Being nice is not being naive. It's investing in your security, investing in your future. So it's so much has been written about Africa's problems. But what if we flip the switch and see Africa as part of the solution? What if addressing climate change, for instance, offers solutions to Africa and to the rest of the world? Here is Ayan Adam from the African Finance Corporation talking to us on the global, uh, the African impact on global transformation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anita. And uh, let me also thank our colleague from the Norway Africa Business Association, who have invited me today here to address on this important topic of Africa as a driver of global change. And how can Norway and Africa collaborate in this new chapter? Um, as Anita has highlighted at the beginning, 
to make the 20th century a memorable time for us to move forward in a mutually beneficial way. Um, so I also want to, I was very inspired by Her Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Norway, Anniken Wittwer. I was, um, and there are many things in her speech as I was going through my speech that I will reflect on because I do believe the current trajectory of Norway and where we are today, Arndo, it's something that can link with Africa. So allow me and thank you for having me here. So I think I'm going to start with the statement of the, of the Africa context today and look at it from some of the sustainability and the climate challenges that Africa faces and turn that into opportunity for all um, humanity, Asia, Europe, and Africans itself can turn that into opportunity. So Africa has not created the current sustainability challenges. We are the least contributor to the current stock of greenhouse gas emission. Around 4% is the estimated on the higher end. And that 4%, when you break it down, you have around 60% where it's South Africa coal mine and a bit of North Africa that has industrialized. The bulk of emissions in Africa are coming from the fact that we are chopping trees for cooking. So having said that, we are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis that's happening in Africa. In 2020 and 2021, we have experienced 131 climate disasters. It's not reported well in the Western media, but there are many media outlets. It is reported in the Middle East and in Africa itself. 99% of those were floods, 16 massive storms, 14 droughts, which have left a lot of people in East Africa uh, dying, and two massive wildfires. Left unchecked, I would like to present the thesis that climate change threatens livelihood. It threatens the solutions that Africa could provide to the global um, um, collective to transition and to develop our economies. It will undermine the progress that Africa has made in achieving sustainable development goals and the Africa Union agenda for 2063. Without significant improvements in resilience, economic loss from damage of the infrastructure alone will move from around a quarter of a trillion or 250 billion to close to half a trillion by 2030. Living in this uh, climate threat, African nations are more motivated uh, than ever to find solutions to the current crisis of global warming, which is having a significant and manifesting in damages, not just in, in the context of the economic growth, but it's also resulting in massive migrations from Africa into Europe, and also sinking one of the richest resource-rich co uh, continents in the world into poverty. So Africa, I want to argue, that is actually instrumental to achieving the global net zero. And, but we need to change the narrative of that means. How can Africa be a solution to the net zero? We need to change the climate narrative and as Africans, we feel the solution lies in three proposals. The first, um, the continents offset significant amount of carbon emissions as of today through tropical and mountain forests. Some of our mountain forests actually absorb more carbon than the Amazonia in Brazil. These are powerful natural African sinks that absorb an estimated 1.5 billion tons of carbon. What's that? That is equal to over 300 million cars outside of the streets. This means we can offset transport in the United States. We feel this is a critical solution and we need to monetize this in an effort for us to be the largest contributor to the net zero game. It's a significant amount if we can take every car up the aisle of the United States and offset that with Africa's carbon sinks. Um, this is very meaningful because the number one issue that's facing, that's leading to deforestation, it is actually using firewood for cooking. 
Like His Excellency said, for Africa, we do need to use our abundant resources in gas to create LNG solutions for cooking, clean cooking. This is possible. So we are proposing that the, the carbon story and the taxonomy in Europe should include the carbon offsets and a fair trading thereof to support the world to quickly transition to net zero. Second, I would like to outline that significant contribution of Africa to global net zero is by massively reducing shipping. What do I mean by this? If global shipping were one country, it will be the sixth biggest greenhouse emitter after China, the United States, India and Russia and Japan combined. For us in Africa, this means a complete rethink of the economic structure of Africa. Rather than exporting our abundant natural resources, including significant deposits of um, transitional metals to Asia, then back to Africa and then again to, to Europe, we need to invest in supporting primary processing, first few stages of processing significant amount of these resources in the continent. This will build circular economies, will create employment and reduce the massive migration that we are seeing um, into uh, Europe and others. Just in this city, uh, Governor uh, uh, Gina Lund last night at the dinner outlined the issues that are faced in this city of Arundel, where there is a significant unemployment, so people shouldn't be coming here because the city itself is suffering from significant unemployment, change in the global structure. So we need to keep people productively employed in the place of origin. Three, Africa has the largest reserves of minerals and metals required for the global energy transition. We need further investment from Europe and others. Also, we need Norwegian companies, a company in Arendelle, to invest in mining and transportation and processing in Africa. This will give competitive returns to investors. Um, we, I just want to highlight that a lot of this we have outlined in the Africa Finance Corporation white paper, which says a, a roadway to Africa's COP, COP27. It's a pragmatic approach to look at the balance and the need for emissions reduction while also uh, building the economic structures of Africa. It is not only in regards to climate change that Africa offers realistic global solution to the world economy, um, which is facing triple issues as of today. The runaway food and fuel-led inflation, coupled with stagnation, and not to mention the, 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 the ravages that migration can cause. It, uh, uh, when people are coming to places that are already facing stagnation. Africa has the potential to provide the kind of economic boost our time that China has led for Asia in the last two decades. How? Simply put, Africa is a resource powerhouse with 60% of the world's arable land in Africa, 30% of the world's mineral resources, 12% of the world's oil reserves, 8% of the world gas reserves. These are important and amazing sectors for creation of economic function and monetization of this mineral wealth. Africa, are, uh, Africa and the world are missing out on the biggest investment opportunity. Um, and it's not a complex proposition. And I did forget one point in terms of the other resource I mentioned. Um, um, arable land, world mineral resources, 12% of gas, 8%, but also at the current trajectory, Africa will have a population dividend, which is projected to be um, close to 1 billion of consumers that the world could have. The starting point is infrastructure and the lack thereof. Power transport logistics translates into value capture of raw resources, jobs, and industrialization. This translates in significant and lucrative investment opportunities. Let's take, for example, a work that we are doing actually in Benin, where we are transforming Benin's raw cotton to t-shirts, complete with traceability of origin 
evidence of sustainable value chains, this will turn this sector from its current primary export of 2 billion to 38 billion opportunity. These are the kinds of things that are important. We know this because we did exactly the same in Gabon. We have invested in um, transformational projects in sustainable wood and furniture uh, manufacturing, where we have invested in the manganese as a resource. We have, uh, together with a partner firm, uh, Olam, uh, and the government put together a, a net zero state of the art um, um, industrial park. Um, and our research tells that we can transform that with cobalt, nickel, and battery, and cathode precursors. We're doing that in DRC today. Africa Finance Cor Corporation, which is a corporation that I represent, is the evidence of the viability of Africans' opportunity to deliver both development impact and competitive investment returns to investors. In the last 15 years, we built a 10 billion balance sheet using African money. We have supported 36 countries to, to, through value-based um, 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 transformation of their resources to manufacturing, building the transport infrastructure, the logistics, as well as providing power into an investment-grade institution, which is one of the top three highest rated. In order to focus further on the positive social and environmental impact combined with competitive return, um, this year we had established last year the AFC Capital Partners, which I had, and we have an Infrastructure Climate Resilient Fund. What does this fund need to do? It is to climate-proof Africa's infrastructure, and through this fund is to create more resilience to the impacts of climate change in accordance with the Paris Agreement. Through this fund, we're providing institutional investors in Africa, in Asia, and other places access to de-risk sustainable infrastructure across the African continent. Emissions have no borders. Development today has no borders because people move around. So it's very important for us that we build a, a, an Africa that is sustainable, that provides solution to the global challenges, but also retains it is um, workforce in-house. Going forward, we plan to create multiple opportunities for the global world to contribute. Now, I would like to end that let's link Arendelle to the mineral belt of, of Africa, have a value-based relationship, and we can invest both in Arendelle as well as the African countries that are going to support making this a high-end battery manufacturing. But it starts with the linkages that Africa can provide solution to the global challenges faced today. China has seen that, and they are doing it. So let's move productively. I really want to thank you for your time and, um, and for your indulgence with my few talking points. Thank you. If you have questions, please send it to the Minty platform. Any questions? Don't see any. Um, thank you, Ayan, for uh, this you know, wonderful presentation where you take us to Africa and you show us the opportunities and the uh, challenges. You mentioned the uh, infrastructure. The starting point is infrastructure or the lack thereof. There we go. You know, this is the problem. Also, the fact that it's one a very important thing to make the infrastructure resilient, equally important to make societies resilient to these multiple tragedies that are happening because all this building takes time, but Africa is already reeling under drought and floods. So what can be done now to safeguard people? Thank you so much, Anita. Very important um, 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 question that you ask. I think um, it's, it's very important that we first recognize the importance of building resilience. And I would say it is not very challenging because two-thirds of Africa's infrastructure, Africa faces 2.3 trillion worth of uh, infrastructure that needs to be built. A lot of this infrastructure, we did a, a very comprehensive analysis. 90% of that is at the concept stage. So Africa is not already built 
So the opportunity now is to ensure that in the design and conceptualization that we are taking resilience measures into account and that we are reaching out to experts in, in Netherlands and other places to support in the design. It's cheaper to design. It is very expensive to retrofit. Mm. So Africa has an opportunity because of the fact that a huge part of this infrastructure has not been built. So that is one point. Second point is we do need to conserve the, 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 the large carbon sinks. Mm. And we need fair trading of that. And that will result in economic growth for Africa that could be financed by that. And I would like to go back to Her Excellency's note when she was asked, um, should Norway get out of oil and gas? I do believe Africa has abundant gas reserves, at least. It is very important to use that wisely and to use that as a transitional fuel that will support economic growth so that we can support these disasters and also get the climate finance architecture hmm. to look at Africa with the right narrative. It is not only a renewable game. Hmm. It is a carbon game. Hmm. It's a resilience game. And yes, it is a renewable game for the countries that are emitting. Thank you. That's right. Um, you mentioned, uh, you talked about migration. Now, migration is a very big political and moral issue in Europe. Um, people would not migrate uh, to other countries, you know, these desperate people making desperate crossings, you know, resulting in tragedies so often. People would not migrate if they had, you know, uh, decent uh, jobs and peace and, uh, you know, a decent quality of life or living, you know, livelihoods in their own countries. So what can be done to improve their lives? Because if it was good, they would stay back in their own countries. So I think this is not just a problem for the global community. It's also a problem for Africa. It is important we address the issue of governance and to create the right opportunities for our people in the continent. And what do I mean by that? I think we need to govern better. We need to have access to education and jobs. We need to look at how do we transform these economies from being primary exporters of minerals into um, um, employment belt. I mean, industrialization is, I don't know how many step game. I do, I do believe there's a role for Africa to look at the first few stages of industrialization and to look at creating these jobs in the continent. When people have opportunities, they don't migrate. And it's not just migration, you have fundamentalism and other things that are also um, at play. So it is creating that, you, when you have opportunity, you will not migrate. That's exactly. And, and, and at the core of it, that is it. Climate change is adding a multiple dimension. And this is why for us in Africa, resilience building is key. Because if you are a fisherman today in some parts of West Africa, drought has caused you, it has replaced everything you knew how to do. So now you are like, I don't know how to do this. I can't fish anymore. Let me just risk myself and be on the oceans. Maybe there is an opportunity in Europe, not knowing that Europe is also facing their own challenges mm. today. So this is very important that we are one global village and we are not fully cognizant of all. So uh, opportunities like this, it increases the awareness and that we are one humanity, emissions have no border, development challenges have no border, and increase in security, peace, and the impacts of climate is really dislocating how we have seen things. Thank you. And uh, one last question. What is uh, Africa's experience with China's Belt and Road Initiative? We hear a lot of, from Asia about how it has caused debt and all kinds of environment problems and so on and so forth. What has been Africa's experience from your perspective? This is a very important um, topic, I think. But to me, the way I see the, um, and this is my personal reflections, the China Belt and Road Initiative you can think of it as we can focus on the environmental and other challenges, but I think it signifies a different economic reshuffling, I would say, from a globe. China is making its way to where the resources are. They're building the right infrastructure. Um, if you look at the countries on the belt, 
These are countries that are somewhat replacing Europe's role in Africa to, to creating Asia Middle East role in Africa. So I see it in two different ways. We got to look at the geopolitics and say, look at these economies that are on the Belt and Road Initiative. Look at the geopolitical. Is this a preparation for China to take a more prominent role in the world economy? Then what is Europe doing in return? The second question is, um, and we've seen this in infrastructure too, Afri uh, China is, next to African governments, China is the largest investor in African infrastructure today. So I think you can couple it, but I would rather look at it from a macro and geopolitical point of view and say, what does that say? Is Europe becoming insular? Are we, is there a new power that is coming into the sphere? What is the implication? We are just experiencing that. But I can tell you that when I travel in Africa, definitely China is present. It's present in every level of society. You just land in the airport in um, Angola. Everybody is way, the, my whole flight was 70% Chinese, 20% African, and maybe one or two European. So we are seeing a change in the global order. I don't know what it means because I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't know if we, but time will tell that this is a force that we need to recognize in the new world economic order. That's all I could say. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I have something to tell you. That sounds, uh-oh, something that parents dread to hear, right? Well, as you know, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, was to be here with us right now. Um, and then the Prime Minister of Nor Norway, Jonas Garstura, wanted him, wanted Kevin Rudd to give a briefing to the Nordic Prime Ministers in, uh, in Oslo. Great, except that the time was right now when Kevin Rudd was committed to Global Outlook. So, tough choice, huh? Well, let's face it, we are not the Prime Minister of Norway, you are not Nordic Prime Minister, so we lost him. But all is not lost. You know, one of the transformations of this pandemic has been that uh, we can go digital. But this is not a preferred option in Arndals Uka because the whole idea is to encourage personal interaction. But an exception was made because of the exceptional circumstances. And thanks to Stina Torgerson of the University of Agder and a member of the Global Outlook Committee, who was responsible for getting Kevin Rudd to Norway, uh, she managed to salvage the situation with the full support of the Global Outlook uh, Committee. And we will uh, get Kevin Rudd live from Oslo, um, fr in fact, from the Prime Minister's office as soon as he finishes his briefing uh, with the Nordic Prime Ministers, and we expect this to happen at 1.30. I just want to say a word about Kevin Rudd. He speaks fluent Mandarin, and he is one of the leading China scholars in the world, which is why Global Outlook booked him, which is why the Prime Minister of Norway wanted him to brief the uh, Nordic Prime Ministers in the aftermath of the rising tensions between China and the United States after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. This also shows that Global Outlook works hard and spends resources on getting you some of the best the top experts from around the world so that you can listen to them and form your own independent judgments in the true spirit and purpose of Arndals Uka, which is informed public opinion makes democracies strong. So I'll just say a couple of words more in terms of just setting the scene for Kevin when he comes on at 1.30, because at that time, there's no time. It's all time for Kevin, and everything will go very quickly. So I just want to mention that he has recently published a book, and it's called The Avoidable War. And he is referring to a potential war between the United States and uh, China, which many scholars believe is inevitable. It's inevitable because history shows that in 12 of the 16 cases, 
the rising power and the ruling power are doomed to conflict. This is known as the Thucydides trap. It is named after the Greek historian. So we could not avoid the Russian war in Ukraine. How are we going to avoid this war between the United States and China? You know, this rivalry between China and the United States is now referred to by experts as the GOAT, G-O-A-T. And it stands for the rivalry, which is the greatest of all times. So the 2020s is the decade that is going to be so transformative in terms of which way is this rivalry headed? Is it going to be uneasy calm? Is it going to be hostility? Is it going to be war? Which, if it happens, is going to be the deadliest that the world has ever seen? So we wait for Kevin at 1.30 and hope to get his insights on this very, very powerful issue, which actually Global Outlook, to be fair to Global Outlook, has been focus focusing a great deal on this precise issue. Of course, none of us foresaw what was going to happen in Ukraine. Um, now we will get going with our panel discussion. So, I may, uh, so uh, could I please request our panel members to come on stage? <laughs> so earlier I mentioned that transformations are driven by revolutionary changes in three areas of human life, energy, food and communications and believe it or not our panelists are experts in precisely these three areas and of course much more. So we have Sven Ture Wulsetter, uh, he is the CEO of Yara. We have uh, Ilva Lindberg, she is the Executive Vice President, uh, Strategy and Communications in Noor Fund, which is Norway's development finance institution. And we have Nick Butler, Energy Specialist and a visiting professor in uh, King's College, London. Welcome, wonderful to have you three. <laughs> So, people say that we are drowning in four C's. And the four C's stand for basically COVID, conflict, climate crisis, and cost of living crisis. So, this panel discussion today is titled, Is This Going to Be a Decade of High Costs and uh, Shortages? And we are going to look in from these three angles, which are fundamental to human civilizations, we will be looking at these three angles, energy, food, communications, but communication expert is also an expert in finance and also sustainability. So we will cover the whole range of uh, issues on this. Uh, Sven, if I could start with you, um, what do you think would be the global impact if these high costs and shortages continue? Well, um... What we're seeing right now is uh, is extraordinary. Uh, we're witnessing the the, the um, biggest cost of living crisis uh, since the Second World War, and you mentioned that the the four C's cost of living is one of them. But it's you know the, the three other ones: conflict, uh, uh, COVID, and climate. It, it again, it's it's the poorest people paying the highest uh, price, and they are the ones hardest hit by COVID, hardest hit by by climate change, and hardest hit by by conflict as well, and now they're, they're seeing significant increases in cost of financing and cost of energy and, and food, uh, the, the area that we're particularly working on from, from our side in, 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 in the other. And, and, and uh, after decades now of um, reduced hunger in the world, it's been moving in the wrong direction this, uh, this year and, and rapidly so. So since the start of the year, uh, until now, 400 million more people have become food insecure, and um, that is a driver of uh, instability. When we look at um, the Arab Spring, the, the, the cost of living uh, or cost of food at that point compared to right now, numbers are even, even worse. So what that will trigger, and we heard from Ion as well, and in terms of uh, migration, what happens if you cannot uh, give food to your children? Uh, you, you have a mass migration and instability, fundamentalism, and so on. So it's, Do you it's think really it will destabilize the world if it continues like this? 
Well, it, it, it's happening already. Uh, we're seeing uh, food and uh, energy being used as weapons in war uh, right now. So, so that's happening as we're, we're speaking. And uh, the longer this continues, uh, the worse it will, will get. That said, there are some positive things uh, happening as well, also in the food sector. And we see now on, uh, the role of the United Nations uh, in, in trying to do the utmost to... to to get food to flow freely. We've seen some ships with, with grain leaving from, from uh, Ukraine, but, it, but indeed it's, it's, it's really a huge uh, challenge. And the longer it takes, the worse it will get. I just want to check with the audience. Are you able to hear him well? Yeah, okay. My, I'm hard of hearing. <laughs> okay. um, Nick, if I can ask you, but I do want all of you all to just jump in. Don't, I should actually not even be here to moderate. You should be having a discussion among yourselves. That's a good discussion, okay? So just feel free to jump in to either, uh, so, you know, kind of agree in some sense. If that is there, not so interested. But if you oppose, definitely interested. So that's, you know, just so that we have different points of view across. Nick, uh, the pandemic and the uh, war in Ukraine, to what extent and in what way will they influence the energy market in the long term? I think the danger now, and we've seen it over the last six months, is that what was a really creative debate on climate change and global action, I was at the Glasgow COP26 meeting, has changed into a debate on energy security. Mm -hmm. And energy security is very much about what happens in one country, each single country. It's also something that changes the nature of the energy business and puts it back into the hands of governments. Now, governments are always there. It's a hybrid business, private money and public power. But I think what we've seen, because energy security appears threatened and is threatened, uh, governments take over more and more of the market. And that means that they focus rather tightly on national interests, which is quite legitimate. That's their job. But it means that there is far less international dialogue now. And I think we've seen since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the energy market breaking into different segments. So I think you will see people trying to do bilateral deals for supply. Germany tying up a deal with Qatar. Uh, India also dealing with the Middle East, with Iran and Saudi Arabia, China doing deals around the world, Bi a bilateral restructuring of the market. And that is inevitable, uh, but it does take away the conversation from the international cooperation that is necessary and the transfer of technology, which I think is crucial to solving climate change, that becomes secondary. And that, I think, is a real risk. So in Britain, for instance, there's a big debate right now about the high price of electricity and how it might go up to £4,000, which is impossible for ordinary people mm -hmm. to pay. And what does that mean? How is this problem going to be solved? That the government is going to come in and uh, subsidise? Can't uh, believe uh, that happening in Britain. Yes, no, th th I think you're right, that they will have to come in because ordinary people can't afford a bill that goes up suddenly from... £1,500 to 4000 and more. Not just the poor, but quite a lot of people across society and businesses as well. Uh, and so I think the proposals that have been put on the table today, which are not yet policy, is to freeze the price cap where it is and for the government in some way, perhaps through taxing the companies, perhaps through taxing individuals, will cover the extra cost. And this is one more example of the state, even in a country with a government of the centre-right uh, getting into the energy market because there's no alternative. So, I mean, one of the long-term changes could well be that big government is back. That is already the case, and, <laughs> and, and it will be... And that can be good if the government is good. And, but the government... Depends does on who you ask, look, right? The government does tend to look just to the national interest at a time when we need a, a global interest to be represented as well. Um, Ilva, Nur Fund is invested in many developing and very vulnerable countries and all these challenges that we have now outlined, how is that impacting the projects over there? Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Nur Fund is like 60% of your portfolio is in renewable energy. So what is happening to all these investments and how are they doing these projects? 
So I think to, to build on, on Nick's point, uh, the more insular and inward looking trends that we're now seeing in Europe, so being concerned about our own energy, our own in energy insecurity, tends to mean that we no longer really think about or understand the impacts that this is having in other parts of the world. Uh, and I heard the Ghanaian president speak in Brussels a couple of months back about the implications of the war in Ukraine. And he said, you know, the bombs are falling far away, but they're hitting us here in Africa. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. Uh, so we're seeing the impacts on the ground, but the Ukraine is one thing, but that's only amplifying something that was already there to begin with, as Fain Tuol talked about with the increasing prices of food and energy and fertilizers and so on. So this is hitting these countries really hard. And then I think the second thing that we're seeing as a consequence of this, including with rising interest rates and so on, is that capital is now flowing the wrong direction. So we're seeing capital flowing out of developing countries rather than into developing countries, where it really is desperately needed. Because when risks are higher, when interest rates are increasing, then investors tend to move back to their safe havens. Um, so the projects, how are they faring, the ones that you have out there, are they kind of slowing down? Is it difficult now for yeah. them? So I think for now, the impacts are not uh, huge across the board. So we're not seeing you know, devastating impacts across the board. But just to give you an example, as you said, we have a significant part of our portfolio in renewable energy. And uh, for some of these projects, we're now seeing that they're becoming more difficult. Uh, they're moving more slowly. Uh, so that's a real challenge. And we, of course, know already that the financing gap for renewable energy in developing countries is enormous. We need to increase it by six times if we're to meet net zero. Mm. And at the same time, we have capital costs that are as much as six times higher. Mm. And we're now seeing the capital outflows combined with resource scarcity. You know, these kinds of projects will be moving more slowly, they'll be more difficult, and they'll be more expensive which yeah. means that we as Norfund need to step up even more. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, French shoring is the magic mantra right now. It's not uh, offshoring, onshoring, it's French shoring, which is basically locating factories and supply chains in friendly countries. And of course, this does de-risk the supply chains and so on and so forth. Now, Yara is, uh, has operations in something like 60 countries, and I'm sure most of those locations were selected on the basis of availability of raw materials and low labor wages, etc., etc., which is why you also outsourced from Russia and Belarus. But how do you see this trend uh, of French shoring? I mean, does it, it's political, but does it make economic sense? There, there's no straightforward um, answer to that because it, I mean, we're, we're operating in, in 60 countries and we're selling to 160 countries. It's truly a global uh, company. And I do believe that uh, trade is an enabler of uh, dialogue and, uh, and also in, in driving uh, values and expectations as we do everywhere that we're operating. Um, that said, I, I think we have to find something in, in the middle here as well, because we've seen now how vulnerable the, the global value chains are and how easily they break down first with bottlenecks from, from COVID, but now also when you look at the energy system, look at the food system, yep, a lot of value creation, uh, a lot of um, more uh, production as, uh, as well by, by localizing it where it's more most optimal but extremely vulnerable. And we see that with Russia's outsized role in, uh, in fossil energy, in food, and also in key uh, raw materials. When that's cut off or threatened to be cut off, uh, you know, it creates a lot of uh, disturbances and shortages and cost increases, just like we're doing now. So, but uh, but, but I, I think we're, by moving completely back to only doing business with friendly countries, we're missing out on something uh, as well that I think is highly, highly valuable. So we have to Balance. discuss this and, and, and find yeah. Yeah. find something in the middle. Yeah. And if I just may add to that, Anita, uh, in Norfund we're seeing, of course, the impacts also of these very fragile supply chains in Africa. And what we're now trying to do going forward is to invest more in local food production for the local markets. I mean, historically, uh, quite a few of our investments have been exporting, you know, flowers, papayas, and so on. But now trying to do more of the local processing and value add in Africa, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, sending off the raw cashews to somewhere else, to China or somewhere else for them to be processed. Mm -hmm. So bringing it closer to get more of the value add. 
In That's what Ayan was talking about. The Benin, you know, cotton can be made into T-shirts right there. And then you have a huge industry which leaps from 2 uh, billion to 38 billion or whatever. So, you know, you have it. Uh, but I think this is like when you have uh, raw materials and things like that. And, uh, you know, you, it's like Apple, for instance, that mobile phone. It has 43, uh, it has components from 43 countries. Mm. And, um, you know, the raw materials would be many more countries. So, you know, it becomes, we, are, we were so integrated. It's mm. not so possible to unravel it uh, like that. Uh, Nick, um, this climate, uh, this energy crisis that we are seeing, there are these shortages and high prices. Uh, to what extent will this result in a slowdown of climate action and walking away from Glasgow? You were there, you said, or those Glasgow promises. I think it's a mixed story. I suspect in Europe uh, it is going to lead to more renewables, particularly investment from Germany and other countries, to displace the gas that has been relied on is coming from Russia. And I think you see that already beginning. And that is a good thing. Uh, but it does leave a lot of the rest of the world behind. Uh, and I think that there is a real risk of Europe thinking of itself as, a, as, as moving and solving the climate problem by going in that direction, but actually ending up just being a clean Europe in a dirty world. Because... Uh, you can't solve climate change in one country or one continent. And I think what worries me about European policy is this idea that you're going to have trade restrictions on countries that are not up to European standards, which effectively means most of the rest of the world. And I think that that leaves them behind, and Europe, with its wealth, should be investing in those countries, helping them to become lo more low carbon and investing in the technology and the transfer of that technology. So uh, I think Europe will become cleaner itself. I worry about Asia where I think that both China and India and Indonesia and other people seem to be using more coal uh, instead of the gas at the moment in the short term uh, and not all of them have a clear plan for reducing that coal consumption, which is one of the main sources of uh, carbon emissions worldwide. So we need to think of these things on a global basis, and we're not quite doing that at the moment. Just on a bit of an optimistic note on, on that challenge, I think the Norwegian government has uh, given Norfund a new mandate just this year to invest in renewable energy in the countries that, right. that Nick is talking about. So India, Indonesia, South Africa, coal-intensive countries with the exact ambition of avoiding future emissions and replacing planned coal-fired power plants with more renewables. Mm -hmm. Now, I, you know, it's a first step. It's relatively speaking a small fund, but I do think that it's definitely a step sure. in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do with that fund is not just to invest Norfund's money or the Norwegian government's money, but also to then mobilize large-scale private capital to move into that space, because otherwise it simply won't be enough. And, and, and just to, to build on that, this, and, and you said it in your introduction, Anita, on, you know, when we go 10 years from now and look back in, in history, could this be a point in time where we really made significant uh, changes? And, and I really believe in humanity's ability to overcome challenges when faced with a with a tangible threat. Uh, who would have thought it would be possible to develop vaccines in the timelines that we were for, uh, for COVID? It, it was unthinkable, but it was done. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with the climate crisis, one of my biggest worries has been that it, it's not really a tangible threat ah. before you pass the tipping point. Yeah. Yeah. But with the energy system's key role in this, if we could now fundamentally change this and see that developing a new energy system will solve both the tangible threat that we're faced with right now, both on dependency on, on Russia and fossil, but also the need to invest in more renewables so that we really do speed up uh, this yeah. process. And I, I run a company that was founded by one of the, uh, one of the uh, people from Arndal, Sam Eide. Uh, and uh, when you look at what were they doing when the world was faced with a hunger crisis 120 years ago, they built out two full-scale factories, two full-scale hydropower plants from IDEA 1903 until that was up and running, eight years. That's, 
it's eight years until 23. It is possible, but it takes political will. It takes uh, will from, from the business community and also collective um, society to get this done. But it is doable. It needs the crisis to be at a desperate stage. Then everybody will act. <laughs> yes, uh, Nick, you want? I think one of the lessons of this year is that uh, trust has been lost. Yeah. So we've stopped relying on Russia for supplies. Uh, and everybody is trying to be self-sufficient or to do bilateral deals. I think there's actually a real r role for Norway in restoring some trust because you are both a producer of oil and gas in this country and, and of uh, renewables such as hydro. And you have an ability to look out across the world and see things in global terms, which a lot of other countries don't have. And I hope, and this is one of the themes of the ONS meeting at the end of this month, uh, I hope Norway, and it, it matches what the minister was saying, can play an active role in restoring trust. I think it should be possible to bring together producers and consumers uh, in a way that uh, helps the future uh, rather than just retreating into nationalism. And I hope that some countries, maybe not Norway alone, can do that and uh, see how badly trust has been damaged and see how important it is to restore that. We have uh, quite a few questions from the audience. China and Russia and many other smaller but emerging powers are anti-democratic. How does the panel view the chances of our Western global liberal democratic system in the future? <laughs> Well, I, now be the politician. <laughs> yes. I, I, don't, I don't think we've reached the no, end. The Brits, of the Brits are never short for answers. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we've reached the end of history. I don't think everywhere is going to become a liberal democracy overnight. Uh, but I think that we should uh, make the effort not to just cut people off, not to sanction everybody in the world that we don't agree with, but to actually engage through trade, through business, through dialogues like this. Uh, I think that's so important. Otherwise, we will uh, balkanize the, the world economy, and that could lead to conflict. So uh, demonizing the other side is not the solution, yeah. and shutting people off is not the solution. Mm. Uh, I think that's true not just between nations, but also within nations. Mm. Um, and uh, we heard the foreign minister speak to this. I mean, there is an emergence on the far right, the far left, you know, different ex extremes, if you will, of the political spectrum. And you're seeing also that within countries. The US is one example of that, mm. uh, you know, with the Proud Boys and uh, all of this movement now m starting to move into, or at least trying to move into mainstream mm. politics. So I think we need to look at this within countries as well, not just yeah. between countries. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, um... Well, in just uh, six minutes from now, I think we'll have the, the, yeah. the oh, best person in the, yeah, in the, in the world almost to, 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 um, to shed light on that. And I, I had the opportunity to, to meet with him back in February of 2020, uh, looking at the, this from Australia's point of view so, so, uh, and, and uh, how uh, his predictions have uh, really come through in the last couple of years has been just remarkable. So, so I, I think really something to look forward to, to, to mm -hmm. listen more to that now. We're sort of the, the warm-up band before we get the stage, right? <laughs> That's always welcome. Uh, another question. Uh, it's from Plan International. How can we scale up investments in small-scale farmers, many of whom are women? Can it be profitable in your view? I suppose that's directed to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think the uh, tabloid answer to that from Norfund is no, actually, because investing directly in small scale farmers when you are an investor, a minority investor, commercially based like Norfund, is uh, not doable and we shouldn't be doing it. However, what we can do is to invest in companies that are buying from and developing small scale farmers. So an investment like uh, Lilongwe Dairy in Malawi, one of the world's poorest countries, an excellent example, where they are then buying milk from 10,000 local farmers and supporting them in uh, stable, good incomes, but also developing the quality of, of the milk. So by being a reliable and responsible buyer from small-scale farmers, I think that's the best way for an organization like yeah. ours to reach that part of the market, and especially women, actually. 
We have another question. Um, uh, how can Africa rise? What can we, both business and government, do? Is there any uh, thoughts on this? Uh, uh, a lot, and, and, and um, I am touched on uh, a lot of these opportunities from the agriculture point of view. And, and as you mentioned, 60% of the arable land is in, in Africa. But uh, the, the, the sad fact right now is that Africa imports about uh, $40 billion worth of food uh, uh, every year, money that is leaving the continent rather than creating uh, employment opportunities in, uh, in Africa. And there's a tremendous yield gap here. And, and, and by having the, the value chain approach to it, helping to, to also empower small-scale farmers like what we're doing using mobile phones, if smartphones, yes, some of them, but, but not all of them, but, but using mobile phones to, to, to give knowledge about agronomy and, and, and growing food more efficiently, we get both uh, more food produced locally, more nutritious food, less logistics, and, and through that also creating new, new business opportunities. So I'm, from, from our point of view, I, I think Africa will become our largest market at some point in time. When that point in time is, I, I don't know, but uh, that's how we should approach it. it. It's a massive business opportunity. Thank you. There's one more question I think we can take. China's massive economic investments into Africa is concerning. China brings its own workers and extract Africa's resources back to China. Can you please comment on this? You have to comment on this. <laughs> well, I, I think it's not as uh, black or white uh, as, as that. Uh, China are, are making a lot of uh, investments uh, across the world and, uh, and, and with, the, with the right uh, attitudes and, and the right development in, in mind as, uh, as, as well. But uh, uh, it is something to keep in mind for uh, also companies in, uh, in Europe, here in Norway as well, on, on, on looking at Africa as an opportunity and also to bring our values and our way of working in, in there and, and, uh, and through that also influence uh, positively creating uh, jobs and so on. So I, I call out or I, or I challenge businesses as well to, to take more risk, but also uh, there has to be an acceptance that uh, running a business in Africa or in, uh, in other parts of the world that uh, you have less developed uh, system, it is more uh, difficult, it is more complicated. Uh, and uh, uh, to that, we, we also need to have a, an acceptance of that, that running a business uh, in developed countries is more challenging than running right here in Norway, but it is needed. So I will have what we call a rapid fire round where I ask a question and the panelists have to give an answer in one word or a phrase, but not more, not an explanation <laughs> about the whole thing. It has to be just one word, which would be the takeaways for our audience. Um, give one example of a program that could achieve positive transformation in the 2020s. An example is the moonshot in the 60s that happened in the United States, which is, leads to all the GPS and our you know, mobile phone technology, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, give one example of a program that could achieve positive transformation in the 2020s. Nick. The technology which can take carbon out of the air and absorb it into limestone. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. I wish we had more time to explore that. Uh, Ilva. So ag tech transforming food and agri in the same way that the electric engine challenged the internal combustion engine. Ah, okay. So that is like the, the leapfrogging, uh, what you're saying, for the uh, sustainable sector or the, the clean energy should be... So we're putting far too much energy and water into how we produce food in the same way that we put far too much energy into the internal combustion engine. Right. So then, okay. So I used many words. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, send to the... Producing hydrogen from renewable energy, green hydrogen, to ah. be used as a, as a fuel and also into, into fertilizer and agriculture. That will be the game changer, according to you. Yeah. And how are we to... How, what is the best way to achieve this program? So it's like, could it be government regulation or money or creativity or whatever? So what, do you, what is the best way to achieve this uh, carbon capture? Direct investment in the companies that are doing it. And uh, they are being supported by Bill Gates and other people, but I think... No more... advertisement, no advertisement. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ilva? So a combination of true entrepreneurship and informed risk-taking. Okay, yes. okay. And... Massive and uh, immediate investments in renewable energy, wind power, onshore, uh, hydro, more hydropower, more solar power, and also 
in more uh, energy efficient. But the investments should come from the government or the private or private uh, no, public will help. <laughs> it will help. No, it's about having uh, um, uh, legislation and uh, legislation. regulation ah. in, in place and then the money is, is there, the willingness is there, but you need the, uh, the opportunity. The, okay. Um, okay, so there we go. Kevin ready. Uh, Kevin Rudd is ready. <laughs> so thank you all so much. It has been a fantastic panel. Really a wonderful hand. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So now we are ready for Kevin Rudd. Uh, he's going to be joining us from, um, from Oslo. Just to remind you, the, uh, he's going to talk on the 2020s, a decade of living dangerously. Is the United States-China rivalry heading to a catastrophic conflict? Kevin, wonderful to see you. We miss you here, but we are happy to see your digital avatar. Well, it's uh, me in the flesh. It's not my avatar. I'm sorry for not being with you. I'm in, I'm in Oslo, just up the road. But I um, was asked instead to speak to the five Nordic prime ministers about China today. And I finished five minutes ago. That's why I'm not down with you at Arundel. Thank you so much. So welcome to Global Outlook. And I have already spoken to the audience about, uh, briefly about you, your background, and uh, about the Thucydides trap, and also about your wonderful book, The Avoidable War. So now, if you're ready, please go ahead. Sure. I'll speak to you just for 10 minutes or so, and then uh, let's engage in a wider conversation. Perfect. That's what we'll do. But the reason I have uh, written... Yeah, that's the reason I've written this book called The Avoidable War uh, is because as someone who's been actively engaged in the US-China relationship myself for the last 35 years, for the first time in my life, I've become seriously concerned about the possibility of crisis, escalation, conflict and war between these two countries. And I wrote this book before the most recent uh, Taiwan crisis over the Pelosi visit, and I, w and I wrote it just before uh, Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, re reminding us all in the international community that war is no longer a 20th century memory, it's a 21st century continuing reality and the threat of war. In the case of the United States and China, I think it's important to frame our thinking around three basic facts which have changed the nature of the US-China relationship. The first is the rapid changes in the balance of power between the US and China, both regionally and globally, militarily, technologically, economically. So much so that in East Asia and the West Pacific now, uh, if there was an open military conflict between China and the United States over Taiwan, it is difficult to predict now with any confidence who would prevail. So has China closed the military gap. The technological gap is closing as well in all of the major categories of technology, technological achievement, uh, ranging from uh, microprocessors through to supercomputing, uh, through to synthetic uh, biology. Um, and economically, China is still on track to be an economy as large as that of the United States, probably by about the end of this decade. Although there's a question mark now because of China's slowing domestic economic growth. So that's fact number one. Fact number two is this, um, that while China has become more powerful, therefore adjusting the relative balance of power between these two countries, under Xi Jinping's leadership, there is a new leadership style. Uh, I've been around long enough um, to have met Deng Xiaoping, Zhao Ziyang, Hu Yaobang, um, as well as uh, Hu Jintao. Um, and right through this period of Chinese leaders over the last 35 years, they had a single organizing principle, which is to place the centrality on economic growth and to make China's foreign policy a vehicle through which to advance China's economic growth. And Deng Xiaoping had a famous doctrine, which was hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead. In Chinese, it was And so Xi Jinping has turned that doctrine on its head. 
He said it's time for China to go out and strive for achievement, to change the status quo. And he is very much a leader in a hurry, unlike his predecessors. And that's why we see now a much more assertive Chinese foreign and security policy. And the third big change uh, since uh, recent times in US-China-Taiwan has been the decision by the United States since about 2017 to fundamentally change its strategic direction on China, to abandon 35 years of strategic engagement and to embrace instead a new era of strategic competition, both under Republicans and Democrats. And in Washington, and I spend a lot of my time in Washington because I run an American think tank, the Asia Society, which is based in New York, and we have offices in Washington. If you spend time on Capitol Hill with congressmen and senators, the bottom line is it's the one thing they all agree on is now an increasingly hardline Chinese strategy, uh, sorry, an increasingly hardline American strategy to confront China's rise. So they're the three big background points. The last set of remarks I'd make before we turn to an open discussion is this. When I talk about the year of living dangerously, it's not just these underpinning shifts that I've just referred to in the overall geopolitical circumstances of the US and China. We also have a series of live wire concerns out there today, any one of which could create a tripwire to trigger a crisis which could then escalate into, a, into conflict, which could then in, escalate into war. Number one, obviously, is Taiwan. China has dreamt of recovering Taiwan since Mao Zedong uh, won the civil war against the nationalists in 1949. It hasn't changed. But now they believe that it's militarily within China's reach. And he has actually, for the first time, become a leader who has said that he will achieve reunification before the anniversary, the centenary, I should say, of the founding of the People's Republic of China in 2049. Now, you might think 2049 is a long way away. It's 27 years from now. But it's the first Chinese leader to put this within an historical time frame. And when I say by 2049, it doesn't mean in 2049. It could be at any point between now and then. And for those of us who analyse it carefully, the late 20s and the early 30s, begin to increasingly loom large in our mind, because that's a period when Xi Jinping himself would be in office. So Taiwan is a huge tripwire. Number two is the South China Sea, where you have multiple claimant states, including China itself, for large maritime and terrestrial, uh, maritime resources and terrestrial features right across what's called the Paracels and the Spratly Islands. And that's where you have multiple navies and air forces engaging each day. The third uh, is the East China Sea, where each day Chinese forces and uh, other Chinese uh, vessels and aircraft are, frankly, challenging the Japanese self-defense force and its maritime force, self-defense force, in a test of wills over sovereignty over Sankoku and Diaoyudao, these disputed islands in what was once called the Ryukus, just north uh, of um, Taiwan and on the way to Japan. And this is capable of creating an incident every any day of the week. Fourthly, the Korean Peninsula, where Kim Jong-un uh, stands ready to formally become a nuclear weapons state, which would then possibly trigger a debate in South Korea and Japan about acquiring nuclear weapons themselves in order to provide for their own deterrence against the North Koreans, which would in turn bring about a reaction from China. And finally, cyber and space, where there are no rules of the road at present, where cyber attacks are launched every day of the week by uh, China and uh, Russia and others in the international community, where the rolling threat of cyber attacks against the critical economic infrastructure of any of us around the world, including our critical military infrastructure, would again be sufficient to trigger crisis, conflict and war. So there are no rules of the road around any of these things. And therefore, it's why I say we are in a decade of living dangerously. And that, my friend, is why I've written this book outlining a concept of what I describe as managed strategic competition to put these key tension 
uh, areas within strategic guardrails which reduce the risk of accidental crisis, conflict and war. Back to you. So please send in your questions. We have several minutes now to raise the question. Has any come in while they're being uploaded? Um, thank you so much, Kevin, for this. It was very brief. We were hoping to have a longer one, but we are so grateful that we could have at least these 10 minutes with you. Um, do you think, uh, you know, do you, geostrategic accidents never come out of thin air, uh, as the First World War showed. Do you think Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan uh, would turn out to be one of history's tragic tipping points? Not a tragic tipping point, but of itself uh, dangerous. Um, and I say that as a long-standing friend of Taiwan. Uh, as a kid, when I was learning Chinese, I went and studied in Taiwan. I have many friends there. I've visited there many times over the years. But you see, Taiwan is in the absolute vortex of this geopolitical uh, tension between China and the United States. And underpinning that is what we call the One China Policy. And the One China Policy was something the Chinese and the Americans agreed to in three communiques, 1972, 1979 and 1982. And they explicitly ruled out there being a policy of one China and one Taiwan. The problem is when you have the third ranking person under the US Constitution, President, Vice President, Speaker of the House of Representatives, in Pelosi's case, visit Taiwan and add that to a pattern of other US visits to Taiwan. There were cabinet secretaries who visited during the Trump administration. The danger is this. Beijing is concluding that the Americans, one way or another, are walking away from the one China policy. And for China, that is its own red line, a red line which they defined in the founding documents of the US bilateral relationship in the three communiques I've just referred to. Furthermore, the Chinese are concluding that with President Biden's recent statements walking away from what is called in the United States strategic ambiguity, over what the US would do over Taiwan. That is neither confirming or denying that the US would militarily support Taiwan in the event of an invasion. Uh, by instead, President Biden saying that the US will defend Taiwan. But the Chinese are also concluding that Chinese military strategy is changing to defend an increasingly independent Taiwan. And the reason I have a problem with Pelosi's visit is because it adds fuel to all that fire a fire which already has enough, shall I say, raw kindling at work in it for the reasons I outlined in my set piece remarks before. Back to you. Thank you. We'll take a question from the audience. Uh, could you please comment on uh, China's control of rare earth metals? How do you see this play out with an escalation with the United States and the West? Is it going to be the Wild West? Yeah. Well, the Chinese, I think, foolishly, uh, back in around about 2012, at a time when their dispute with Japan over the East China Sea was at its sharpest, when the then government of Japan formally acquired from Japanese private landholders the four islands which make up Senkoku and Yayudao, back then, to punish uh, Japan, what China did was to suspend its own rare earths uh, supplies uh, to the Japanese market. China, over the years, has become the global source of uh, rare earths um, exports to the rest of the world. Uh, and as you know, they're critical in practically every manufacturing process. So starting back in 2012, uh, Japan, the United States and its Pacific allies, and now European allies, including NATO, have been looking at diversifying our global source of supply for rare earths. Fortunately, there are a number of countries which have sufficient rare earth supplies, which have now become uh, economic to extract. Australia is one, Canada is another, the US itself has some, but there are others uh, elsewhere in the world as well. So the security of long-term supply of rare earths has now become a cardinal principle uh, for US and allied strategy in dealing with China's 
uh, preparedness to use this as a bargaining chip in diplomacy. Back to you. Right. Um, you know, it, President Putin is going to be the president for uh, up to 2036 or something, and she is going to be re-elected now for the third term and probably will be president for life. And as you said, making plans for 2049, that's how long term they are thinking. Contrast that with the United States where we don't know what is going to happen in the midterm elections, let alone the 2024 elections. You've been a former prime minister. How are democratic leaders in this area, uh, arena of uh, uncertainty, how can they take long-term decisions? Well, this, in fact, was a conversation I was just having with the Nordic Prime Ministers. Because all of us who represent democracies, like myself in Australia, uh, we come and we go. And that's just the nature of the democratic process. Um, and uh, that is uh, one of the great enduring strengths of our democracies. Uh, it's like an automatic political stabiliser that whenever uh, a country or a community conclude that a government uh, no longer satisfies uh, their interests, then they are voted out. And our stable institutions, our parliaments, our legislatures, our courts, our judiciaries, etc., underpin the smooth transition uh, to power of an incoming administration, at least until the Americans invented the 6th of January. But that's an entirely separate discussion. Um, the key thing, though, is that the authoritarian world, uh, led by three, um, frankly, autocracies at the moment, uh, Putin's Russia, Xi Jinping's China, uh, and the Iranian regime, have a different view of um, uh, the long-term nature of uh, political systems. And therefore, uh, Putin, as you said, plans to be there until 2036. Xi Jinping, in my judgment, plans to be there until at least 2037, by which stage he would be the tender age of 84. He'd almost be young enough to run for president of the United States. Uh, <laughs> um, and and uh, I've forgotten the age of the, uh, the current uh, Ayatollah in, um, in Tehran, uh, but not a spring chicken. But the bottom line is this. Um, uh, we therefore, in dealing with the authoritarian world, and particularly with uh, Russia and China, and the subject of this session, of course, is China itself, for three more terms, for 15 years, uh, following the 20th Party Congress this October, November in Beijing, which will reappoint Xi Jinping for a record third term. And I believe, based on all my analysis as a sinologist, that he aims to be there for the subsequent three terms. We have 15 years in this critical decade of living dangerously, where Xi Jinping will be at the helm watching the rest of us come and go. So how do we deal with it? We must, in terms of big strategic questions, have bipartisan buy-in in, in uh, our major uh, democratic uh, capitals in the world on the essential nature of China strategy, Russia strategy, and, for example, our rare earth strategy. The encouraging news is this, is that despite the enormous divisions in the United States, and I've lived in the US now for the last seven years, and I've seen it all, um, the bottom line is there is now a very large degree of bipartisan support between Republicans and Democrats on the core elements of US national China strategy. It's an untidy process, but if you look, for example, at the passage through the Congress in the last week of the CHIPS Act, a $52 billion investment, into the United States uh, microprocessor industry uh, right across the country, the fabrication of uh, advanced semiconductors in the US. This was achieved with a high degree of bipartisan support, uh, which is rare if, if not non-existent in other elements of US politics. So what I would argue is, whether it's Europe or whether it's Australia or whether it's uh, the United States, a high degree of institutional bipartisan buy-in is critical for the long-term credibility of our strategy in dealing uh, with China's rise. We take a question from the audience. China is a rising power. We have, as you said, have had several rising powers in history. Which does China resemble? Um, China resembles China. <laughs> uh, and, uh, um, I've been a student of China now uh, since the Mesolithic period. Well, not quite but since I was a kid at university, 
that almost makes it the Mesolithic period. Uh, <laughs> and I have um, studied Chinese language, modern Chinese language, Chinese classical language, Chinese classical history. Before I ever became an Australian diplomat, before I then slid down the food chain of life into politics. Um, and so I have looked long and hard at China's own worldview. And therefore, China, in my estimation, should be seen very much as sui generis, that is, as a unique case. And that's because it's civilizational as well as, as, well as national. Secondly, it is a civilization and a nation currently governed by a Marxist-Leninist party, which exhibits very limited sense of humor uh, on questions of national security and their overall global worldview. And thirdly, uh, we've never had a country which is the most populous nation on earth become uh, the most powerful nation on earth. And for those reasons, if you put those factors together, we are dealing with something which I think is unique unto itself. And so for all of us, it requires us to, frankly, apply a lot of analysis to understanding China as it's seen from the inside out, not just as we look at it from the outside in. And part of the reason, again, for writing this book uh, is the middle part of the book deals with what I describe as the 10 concentric circles of Xi Jinping's worldview. How does he view the world in terms of domestic political power, the economy, national unity, as well as its military, as well as challenges such as climate, as well as its, con its maritime periphery facing the United States, its continental periphery reaching across to Europe, its strategy for the developing world and its redesign of the international rules-based system. It is therefore very much, I think, something which requires us to analyse in its own right rather than simply looking for early repli earlier replications in history. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. There are many, many questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. We appreciate your uh, being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so you've listened to many knowledgeable uh, voices on different topics. So how do you feel? Do you feel we can transform for the better in the 2020s? Yes? No? Maybe? A quick scientific analysis of your facial expression tells me that the answer is maybe. <laughs> Uncertain. And you're right, because the situation is very tough. But the best way to get out of uncertainty is to create. History shows us that the worst case scenarios do not happen when people and societies innovate their way out of problems. So it is up to each one of us to contribute in our own little ways to help solve the problem. It is up to each one of us to write our own stories and to write it well so that future generations can look back on the 2020s and read with a smile. Once upon a time, dot, dot, dot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much and thank you for being such a wonderful audience, great questions, being so engaged. Thank you to all our speakers and panelists for broadening our horizons. And thank you to the sponsors of Global Outlook, GC Inode, Ida Cluster, University of Agder, and Guard. And thank you to the Global Outlook team. They have been working hard for months. Uh, Helena, Stina, Swain, Anne, uh, Tonye, and our uh, technical guru, Eric. And a big thank you also to Ivan Erickson from the Prime Minister's office who facilitated the video link. Thank you so much. Thank you for this being with us today. Bye-bye. <laughs>